Well, I have to ask you this first. What made you decide to sit down and do this interview? Well, um, you know, this was a, a shock to us about a year ago now um, that all this started. And uh, you survive the initial avalanche um, of a totally unexpected situation that really just takes over and dominates your life. And then you have to start figuring out how to fight back. And for me, this was really a no-brainer. Um, there's an opportunity to, to begin to tell my side of the story, which has been very difficult to do. Um, but it's been 10 months, and I really haven't said very much um, other than here or there in a, in a filing or a response or a, a little quote from my lawyer in the newspaper. And um, I, I think it's important to make sure that the other side of the story, the truth um, of, of this story, gets out there. And really, the only person who can tell it is me. So walk me through the day you were arrested. I, it's my understanding that to you, this came out of the blue. Is totally. that right? Absolutely. So walk me through that. What happened? So uh, we were uh, at, at home in bed at 6 a.m., which most people are. Um, and there was a knock on the door. At the time, um, my mother-in-law was living with us. Um, she's had some, some memory issues. She's in a memory care facility here in Bexley now. But at the time, she was living with us. And the, this, the first thing that went through my head when there's a pounding on our front door at 6 a.m. was that she had gotten up and somehow let one of the dogs out into the neighborhood and someone was trying to either alert us or bring the dog back. And, and then my wife ran downstairs. So I kind of thought nothing of it. She's dealing with it, uh, whatever it is down there. And she calls up and says, the FBI is here. And I literally am, I get up out of bed and I start walking downstairs. And the first thought that's going through my head is, I wonder what they want to talk to me about. You know, what could they possibly be wanting to question you know, me about? You know, what issue might be out there? And uh, no sooner do I step outside, they ask me to, 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 to step all the way outside, handcuff me. They never read me my rights um, and wouldn't tell me what was happening. We asked repeatedly, can you tell us what's going on? What's happening here? No one would say. And um, I asked my wife to call, to call Carl Schneider, uh, a lawyer that He's my lawyer now and a lawyer that we'd known for many years and get on the phone and try to find out what was happening. Uh, before the FBI agents had left, they had identified the complainant as the President of the United States. And of course, later on, I've asked a lot of people, my attorney and others, is that something that FBI agents normally say? when they're arresting someone, that the complainant is the president of the United States himself? And everyone, of course, says no. I mean, it could be one of these things where they sort of say, on behalf of the United States government or what have you. So for all I knew, that's what they always say, but apparently that's not what they ever say. You were at one time the head of the Ohio Republican Party. Donald Trump did not want you in that office because you were not a Trump supporter. Was that going through your mind when they said that? Um, you know, there's so many things going through your mind initially. So just talking about that first frenzied hour or so, I don't know that that was the very first thought that went through my head. Really, the first thing that was going through my head is they were taking me to the car to take me downtown, still having absolutely no idea what any of this was about um, and not having been read my rights or, you know, really given any indication of what was going on was just there's been some mistake and we're going to get this clarified. It's just a matter of when and how. Um, I still believe that. And, um, but I had no idea what was coming in the, in the next few days. When you learned that you were being accused of conspiracy and bribery as part of what's now called the householder enterprise, how did you learn that and what was your reaction to it? Well, um, really the first indication that I had that it, that being arrested that morning had anything to do with that was I was driven downtown. It was six o'clock in the morning. The United States courthouse isn't open yet. Um, so they took me to an FBI office where we waited for an hour and a half for the marshal's office to open. And when they took me across the street a little while later, kind of one of the first things I saw when I looked to my left was Larry Householder sitting in a jail cell. And I thought, well, it must have something to do with this. I really still didn't understand why they would have roped me into any of it. 
But that was kind of the first inclination I got. Well, what did you think he might have done? N no idea. Um, just one by one, they brought in the, the five people who were later named in the, um, in, in the uh, complaint and subsequent indictment. Um, and so the, the five of us, householder, speaker householder, uh, myself, um, uh, Juan Cespedes, Jeff Longstreth, and Neil Clark were sitting together in a jail. So it was kind of somebody jokingly, and there's not anything funny about this, but jokingly re referred to it as kind of like the last scene of Seinfeld. We're all sitting around together. <laughs> And, and really, it was just the five of us trying to figure out what the hell was going on. So they had the five of you sitting together. Yes. Allegedly, your co-conspirators. Right. And they allowed you to sit together before questioning? No, none of the things that have happened uh, sort of procedurally um, have really made any sense from, from the, the way the government has handled really any of this. But when you saw who the other four were in this cell with you, did you think to yourself, this might have something to do with all that first energy money? Oh, of course. I mean, what one would assume, given the people who are in that room, that, and we were all essentially agreeing with each other, this must have something to do with House Bill 6, one way or the other. None of us really knew what that was or what any of that would be. It, it wasn't until later on that I was able to read the complaint, which was still under seal at the time, but they, they, they provided us with a copy at least to review. We weren't, weren't able to take it with us. Um, it wasn't unsealed until later that day. Um, and it gave us a little bit of, a, of an indication of what the government's theory in this case was, not only overall, but you know, specifically with specificity to me, what their theory of my involvement w was. Well, their theory is pretty specific about Householder, Cespedes, Longstreth, Clark, and you. They believe that the five of you conspired, planned, uh, and accepted bribes from First Energy to not only put House Bill 6 through, but to make sure that the Ballard effort to defeat House Bill 6 didn't work. So as you're reading that, were you thinking to yourself, okay, I had a role in this? Well, I mean, and I've never once tried to deny that I was a vendor working on a project that was specific to my client, which was First Energy Solutions at the time, which is now known as Energy Harbor. And one of the things that we very much wanted to do was watch very closely what the other side was doing in terms of trying to, there's a process that they have to go through to get something on the ballot. And my, my role in this, what I had pitched and I had um, proposed and gotten funded fr from the folks who were interested in, in seeing this, seeing House Bill 6 survive, was both a legal challenge to whether or not um, this issue could be referendumed at all. Because we were saying it's a tax and the, and the Ohio Constitution specifically prohibits any tax issue from being brought to referendum. And even though the word tax isn't used anywhere in House Bill 6. It fits all of the definitions of what otherwise would be a tax. It's, it's levied by the government, it's compelled, it's, uh, it's broadly um, assigned. Uh, uh, and, and, and so even the legislative leaders agreed that it would be a tax. The opponents of House Bill 6 called it a tax throughout their opposition. So that was one of the things that, that I was working on. And I was also working on collecting information and compiling information from the people who were trying to bring the issue to referendum so that we could eventually, if we needed to, file a challenge to those petitions, which is a very specific process that has original jurisdiction in the Ohio Supreme Court. And, um, and if you're going to bring one of those actions to the Supreme Court, you better have your ducks in a row. And so we were compiling that information. But that's all I was doing. So any of this notion that I was involved in some kind of agreement a quid pro quo between the company and the legislative leaders or anything of that nature was just nonsense. There was never any evidence of that. There isn't any evidence of that. And there never will be any evidence of that because it just didn't happen. This C4 that was set up, uh, we now know, according to the federal documents, the C4, the 501 C4, which is supposed to be set up for social purposes, social issue purposes we now know was part of this generation now that is tied directly back to Larry Householder. Is that correct? Huh? Did you know it was a C4 that was going back to Larry Householder? Well, I knew that there was a C4 called Generation Now. 
I also am very familiar with, and we've dealt with C4s uh, you know, throughout my, my uh, tenure as chairman and working with various campaigns and other efforts. Um, I believed that Generation Now had been established simply for the support of House Bill 6. I had no idea it had a history beyond anything that had happened you know, prior to House Bill 6. Generation meaning you know, electricity generation, energy generation in the state, and that this was a specific entity that was set up to, to help the speaker with uh, defending what he considered to be his signature piece of legislation out of, out of the gate. Um, you know, one of the things that was very interesting to me, and there's been a lot of misinformation put out I think intentionally by the government on this was at that very initial uh, press conference, happened later the day that we were all arrested, I think maybe before I was even home, um, then United States Attorney Dave DeVillers had, a, had held a press conference where he said many things that are just absolutely not correct and provably false. One of the things that he contended at that press conference was that there was absolutely no social welfare program that Generation Now was fulfilling. Well, if you look at the IRS's own um, regulations on social welfare programs, it says, and it's not like he doesn't know this, about four paragraphs down, seeking legislation germane to the organization's programs is a permissible means of attaining social welfare purposes. And so everything that was happening with Generation Now at the time was in support and defense of House Bill 6, a piece of legislation. So it had attained its social welfare purpose. It really would have been helpful if other people had done what I had done and actually read the statutes and read the regulations to know that what, uh, what Generation Now was doing with, uh, with regard to support of House Bill 6 does fit the IRS's own definition of what a social welfare, or welfare organization is. But one of the things they contend is, not only did it say social welfare that mentioned, it did mention energy, but also elderly and other issues that they tied to at a social welfare purpose. But they contend that there was never a proper record that this was controlled by Larry Householder that there was never, that no one acknowledged in any filings with the IRS that this money was going to go to individuals. Larry Householder and Matt Borges, they allege, personally benefited from this fund. Did you benefit from that fund? Like I said, I was a vendor on, on a project that was paid for, my services were paid for, out of funds that came from Generation Now, ultimately. I've never contested that. There were dozens of other people who were working on this project, who were vendors on, on this project. Lobbyists, um, people working on PR, uh, other aspects, there was mail program. You remember, I'm sure, that summer, this was a very contentious and heated issue. There were television ads being run, there were all kinds of things that were happening, and none of those people apparently were, were considered to be personally benefiting from a, uh, a, a social welfare program run by Larry Householder, they were doing exactly what I was doing. A legitimate purpose to defend a law on behalf of our client that required us to spend money and we had the funding for, I, like I said, I pitched this, this specific proposal needed to be done if we were going to see this through to fruition. Um, and, and defend the law that was beneficial to our client. So why were you targeted? Why do you think you're part of this lawsuit if there were a lot of other vendors doing the exact same thing? Well, you know, it's hard to know. And I will say just off the bat that I'm a little tired of people, and I have been from, you know, since July 20th of last year, uh, ascribing different motivations to the, the things that I have done or said. And so I'm trying really hard not to do that when it comes to what other people may or may not have done, but look, there's a couple of things that are as plain as the nose on my face. I was working against the Trump administration, and in July of 2020, there was every reason to believe that Donald Trump very well could be reelected. It was certainly within the uh, Department of Justice and uh, the, 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 the FBI agents' best interests to, um, to demonstrate that they were working on behalf of their boss, the president, I can't really see another reason why they would have identified themselves as having been at our house arresting me that morning and saying that the complainant in the case was the President of the United States himself, which is what they said. Um, and one, of course, has to wonder what other motivations uh, there were out there. But before the end of the day, we're still talking about the day I was arrested, 
before the end of that day, uh, a very dear friend of ours had come to the house and she started telling us about text messages that she was getting from the wife of Dave DeVillers, the then uh, United States Attorney. That Julia DeVillers was texting our friends, telling them not only the details of what had happened that morning, but that she knew about all of it in advance. And so why was she bragging to her friends, about, not about Larry Householder being arrested, not about all any of the other things. You know, I was the big prize that morning, as far as they were concerned, and they were bragging about it. So you think this was possibly politically motivated, and not just politically motivated, but politically motivated from as far away as Washington, all the way down to David DeVillers? There are two things that I think are most important to understand when it comes to what the motivation may have been on dragging me into the situation that I had nothing to do with. One, there is none and there will never be any evidence that I was involved in any kind of quid pro quo or any kind of agreement or any kind of understanding. There are no conversations that I was part of about how money was going to uh, uh, you know, go back and forth between First Energy and Generation Now. I knew none of those things. I'm very thankful that I was never involved or you know, even, even uh, unwittingly involved in any conversation like that. I appreciate the fact that no one ever dragged me into those kinds of conversations. And there will never be an email, there will never be a text message, there will never be a witness who will truthfully uh, testify, there will never be any evidence that the government can, uh, can generate that will suggest that I was ever involved in any one of those things. So, so you have to start with the lack of any actual proof of any involvement in any sort of conspiracy. There just simply was none, and there never will be any, no matter what has been suggested uh, in the government's filings so far. And then you do need to start looking at some of these other, th other things and really wonder what were the motivations to identify themselves as uh, being there on behalf of the President of the United States himself, um, begin to send text messages to friends of ours, which by the way is a crime um, for, for the U.S. attorney to have told even his wife about information that was under seal, that was, uh, that was uh, you know, privileged information within the department. Um, they are specifically forbidden from doing those things by both DOJ policy and by the law when, when you could be held in contempt of court, of course, for divulging information that's under a, a judicial seal, and, and they were doing that. Um, it's, it's really difficult to understand why they would have done those things, and w again, specifically with regard to me. But let's face it, it's been pretty well documented, and there's another story that comes out basically every single day that demonstrates that the Trump Justice Department was up to no good all the time, that he was interested in using it as a political vendetta of an overly politicized uh, department. And um, as more information comes out about how this was handled, and we will get answers. We're going to get the answers. We're going to find out whether someone from Maine Justice or someone from the White House or someone in the, in the political world um, attempted to influence Dave DeVillers or the FBI or anyone else, even if it was just with regard to the timing of, of any of these things, we'll do the public records requests, we'll get that information, and we'll find out, and um, we'll know the answer to that before this is all over. Do you have those text messages from DeVillers' wife? Yes, I do. Before we leave, can we get some shots of that, uh, if you don't course. mind, if we do that? Happy, I do want, I, happy to give those to you. Oh, I can have these? Of course. That's great. Thank you. Um, I. I do want to go through some of the things that I... And there has been, just so you know, there has been a complaint filed with the Inspector General at the Department of Justice about uh, that situation. Has there ever been any response from David DeVillers about how this got to his wife? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, okay. I, I'll, he I will do. have to answer to that. I would think he would, if it's, um, even though he's not in office anymore. Look, I think the ironic part about all of this, and sometimes you have no choice really but to just sort of I guess chuckle at the irony of, of a sad situation like this is that by the time this is all said and done, what will be pretty clear is that he broke the law and I didn't. <laughs> that would give you some justification at the end of all of this, wouldn't it? Well, I don't know that it would really uh, undo I bet, But all I bet it won't cost him what it's cost you. Listen, you know, again, talk, going back to, to talking about that, that first day, by the end of that first week, uh, my business had gone under. 
Um, I had no longer had any clients. Our bank accounts had been closed. My credit cards had been canceled. Uh, obviously, I was the subject of a lot of very um, unpleasant uh, press coverage. Um, my, my face was being plastered all over uh, television and newspapers and, and, and people writing stories and making assumptions and social media just going wild and, and whatnot. Hell, they even took away my, uh, my, my TSA privileges uh, to fly. And this is all because of, of having been accused of something that I didn't do. Um, but those were the types of things that were happening, which just sort of kind of cascading on top of me right out of the gate. Um, there's no way to be prepared for those kinds of things. And, um, but like I said, we had to survive that initial... How of, have you survived? Um, well, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I have, uh, I have a, a terrific wife and family and support um, uh, you know, core of, of friends. Um, people who understand that uh, I would never have done anything like what has been alleged. Um, and, uh, and, and just very, very blessed to have uh, you know, my, my friend Mike, my friend Rob, my friend Brad, my friend Jen, my friend Melissa, um, uh, Todd, Matt, others who, who check in regularly. Um, and, but, but nothing beats having uh, the support of your, of your wife and your family. And I'll tell you something else that I really was pleasantly surprised by and that has been the response of our community. Um, I live in Bexley. Bexley is a pretty blue place. I don't think there's a lot of <laughs> folks who necessarily around here might agree with my politics per se, and they all pretty much know what they are. Um, but these, our neighbors and our friends here and the people who have, uh, or our parents of children who go to school with, uh, with our daughter um, have just been wonderful in their uh, kind of unwavering support. I think they see what very likely was behind the motivation uh, in a lot of this and, uh, and, and feel for us and know that ultimately we'll be exonerated, I will be, and there's no question about that. Um, it's just a matter of getting there. Well, let me, let me go through some of the stuff that I highlighted in this indictment that I'm sure you've read and reread and reread, but stuff that is open now for public view yep. about you. Um, it says that you registered your 17th consulting group LLC back in August. And the implication is that you registered this, that you are the president, owner, and CEO, that you registered this LLC so that money could be funneled through it. That's what they're alleging. Is that why you registered that LLC? It isn't. We uh, actually had um, a I and a number of uh, my colleagues at the time had already decided we were going to leave uh, the law firm that we were working at um, and had started making plans to do that. Um, two of the attorneys who were there at the firm weren't able to be part of the sort of initial um, rollout of 17 Consulting. They joined later in January when we all uh, uh, officially resigned from Retzel and Andrus. Um, but we had been planning for many months to start this business. Um, and the way it worked out, when I and another colleague of mine, it wasn't just me who started, uh, the, 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 uh, who filed the paperwork to create 17 Consulting, um, we did it together understanding that this was an opportunity to bring our first client into our new venture, even though we hadn't had an opportunity to formalize it yet with the people who would be leaving a few months later, and this has all been explained. To and the, the first client was Generation Now. Yes, it so was. this four hundred thousand dollar payment that came in a day or two after you you filed it, you're saying that's just ordinary course of business kind of a of a funding? Yeah, I mean, you never really know when your first opportunities are going to come along when you're starting a new business. And as we were going through the process of discussing um, starting this new venture, and we had been in those discussions for months, for many months, as all of the people who were involved in those discussions will attest to. Um, it just so happened that I was pitching a project that we could do through our new uh, business venture and um, it got approved. And so we needed to have a, a mechanism to fund it through and that's what we did. Um, there, are, there are recorded meetings with your voice on them in which there are discussions about uh, Clark, Neil Clark being a proxy for Householder and what they allege is a conspiracy, that Neil Clark would speak for Householder and that in different conversations, you confirmed that, that 
Neil Clark is the proxy for householder for this C4, for this money coming in. All of that sounds as if there was a conspiracy to have money coming in from First Energy so that it could go out to political campaigns and try to ensure that householder became the speaker. What do you say to those allegations? Well, first of all, it's very important to read those statements very carefully and very closely because nowhere in them do I make any kind of suggestion that I knew of Neil's ability to influence the flow of any money. That's not what I was talking about. We were talk having a general conversation about how uh, our various teams that were working on either side of this referendum issue were constructed and some of the individuals that were involved and I made an observation about, um, about a, a statement that uh, Neil Clark, God rest his soul, um, had made in a meeting that I had been in a few months earlier. It was the first time I'd been in any meeting that had any uh, dealings with anyone from Generation Now. And he did present himself at that time in that meeting, as the other people who were there, I'm sure, will attest, as I'm here as the speaker's proxy. It sort of took me by surprise. and. Again, I don't want to. I certainly don't want to speak ill of of someone who's passed on. Um, Neil was was one who would who who tended to boast a lot, and um, I think as I say and later quoted in that very interview that I thought it was kind of typical of Neil boastfulness. I think I maybe used a little more colorful colorful term. I think uh, you said BS. I did, yeah, or something <laughs> along those lines. Um, but it turned out that it wasn't that he was actually speaking on behalf of the speaker with regard to the project that we were working on. It, what didn't I, it, it, anyone who wants to extrapolate- In your mind. Anyone your who wants to extrapolate any knowledge then fr from that statement that I somehow knew that Neil was directing money from First Energy, or, that's not what I said, that's not what I understood, that's not what I meant, and that is not what any evidence will ever show, and the government knows that. Well, there is also further on in that same, I believe, the same conversation, at least it's uh, on the same day, September 13th, 2019. It says, Borges confirmed householders' management of Generation Now, explaining, like Associate 3, one of the people working for Generation Now, who has to, who has to answer to the press, obviously, he wants to quit so bad, because he's like, this is my reputation now, you know, but he can't because the speaker won't let him, but God, he hates this S word. So it sounds as if you knew something was wrong, that somebody who was charged with being a spokesman for this, for this organization, for Generation Now, wanted out because his reputation was at stake. So didn't you know that something was nefarious? No. That, first of all, the editorializing that Agent Wetzel does in that statement where he says, that that somehow confirmed my knowledge of householders' uh, control of the organization. I was simply talking about a particular individual who, to this point, has remained, has continued to remain anonymous, and I won't, I won't say who it specifically was we were talking about, who had had a specific problem. Look, during the early stages of the referendum effort, there was some very bad press about things that were happening out there kind of on the street. And they were impacting not only the people who were having to deal with the PR on this, it was impacting me too. Because in my project, we were having to make arguments before the Supreme Court, both for the whether or not it was a tax and for the original jurisdiction on a petition challenge. None of us wanted to walk into a situation where the Supreme Court already believed that there was a bunch of thugs on the street knocking cell phones out of people's hands, causing problems, uh, uh, doing a, a, chasing people in cars, doing all kinds of things that, that's, and so, so I and others asked for those uh, activities to, to cease immediately uh, because of the impact that it could have on things that they would very much care about later. I, I personally drafted a, and proposed, although it was never implemented, I had no way of getting it implemented, but I proposed that a code of conduct be um, adopted by the folks who were being sent out into the street. I had no communication, no involvement with those people at all, but I was simply making a, a statement about how out of control a lot of this stuff had seemingly gotten, and one of the people who was working on that project really didn't like having to be the one defending it to the press all the time, and it was driving him crazy. Unfortunately for him, and maybe a little bit for us too, in terms of the things that we were trying to do, 
The speaker thought the press that was happening out there was actually good for the, uh, for the process, and he just didn't really want to hear it. He didn't really want to hear the complaints that uh, the others had, and so, um, you know, I, so I, I certainly made that comment, uh, but would never deny making that particular comment, but it had absolutely no reflection on any, um, any knowledge of anything nefarious that was happening because I just didn't have any, and there will never be anyone who will ever come forward and say that I did. They allege that you tried to bribe one of these ballot people, someone who was working on that campaign, offering them fifteen to $25,000 for insider information. Did that happen? No. Did you have contact with that individual? I did. And did you ask that person to give you the number of signatures they had? There's, there seems to be a recorded conversation in which you said, we're hearing you had 120,000 signatures and, and you were trying to get insider information. Is that true? So what you have here is a, is a, a series of different conversations that were all happening at different points in time that they've tried to daisy chain together in this complaint to make it sound like there was some kind of bribe happening. There was never any bribe. There was never any attempt to have any bribe. There will never be any evidence that there was any bribe. This was a young man who had come to me many times before, who had worked for me on projects many times before, and he had come to me with a specific problem this time. He had been fired from his job at the Ohio Department of Public Safety. He owed tens of thousands, he had $13,000, I believe it was, in back child support, and he was about to lose custody of his daughter. And what he asked me to help him do was figure out a way that he could deal with his, his financial situation. And we sat down and we went through great pains, great pains to figure out how to do it in a way that was legal and that would pass muster when it came to the fact that we were both working on opposite ends of a particular issue at that point in time. It wasn't a campaign yet, but there was So are you saying you issue. loaned him the money? No, I'm saying I hired him on other projects, which is ultimately what we decided to do. And, um, you know, I can't get into the details of what's in this discovery because the government can put statements out like that and then run to a judge and ask for a protective order so that no one else can talk about the truth of what's in those recordings. But what I can tell you is that there will never be any recording, there will be never be any evidence that there was any sort of bribe or any sort of attempt to bribe any person and that my account of the story, which Agent Wetzel in that uh, affidavit later on tries to tries to dismiss as well he didn't really mean it when he said well we'll hire you on other projects I hired Tyler on other projects because that was what was allowed and that's what, what, what was appropriate for us to do and to set aside any issue which I say to him specifically that had any involvement with what we were both doing on the referendum issue Paragraph 85 in the indictment says, between or on or about February 6, 2017, April 28, 2020, Borges received at least $350,000 in Company A to Generation Now payments, which were transferred to him through the 17 consulting bank account. Did that happen? I mean, I don't remember exactly how much all of our um, fees and, and these things were. Keep in mind, we were working on an issue that, if we were successful, would, would help a company um, that, was, that, that stood to make hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And so pricing our services to allow them to, uh, to, to stay in business um, you know, was important for us to do in an appropriate way. Um, and and I'll, I'll never try to deny that we were paid and that, and that uh, you know, I, I was paid handsomely for political projects. I was paid handsomely on a lot of political projects. And, um, and so this wasn't anything that was really out of line with anything else that, uh, that I had worked on. Uh, possibly the most damaging part of this indictment, paragraphs 125 through 128, talks about the money and the pass-through company. At that point, it says between August and 2019 and October, they laundered approximately $1.6 million uh, through your company. They use the term laundered, and that's quite a hefty sum. 
Uh, they go through how money went back and forth through the ballot, through being paid out to different people for signatures, for they allege for bribe money. And then they, they go all the way through and say, after the end of the ballot campaign, there was nearly a million dollars left, $975,000, that they allege went to you and householder personally, and that you then spent that account down to $12 and so many cents, handing out all this money. It, they make you sound like you were at the heart of this conspiracy. How do you react when you read that and you know this is what's going to be alleged in federal court? Well, everything that it, w you just said there is incorrect. Um, and nothing that they'll be able to produce in federal court if they ever are silly enough to take this to trial, um, they'll, they'll never be able to substantiate any, anything like that. Um, I never paid Larry Householder any money. That never happened. If that's alleged in the indictment or in the complaint anywhere, nothing that they'll ever be able to produce will uh, corroborate that. Um, and you know, to use the term laundering money and to use the term bribery, I mean, look, these are terms, these are legally defined terms. In order for any of this money to have been laundered, and this makes sense, you can only launder money if you're aware that the money that you're receiving is somehow criminally derived. If not, if you have proposed a completely legitimate business purpose and you conduct that, uh, that, that business transaction in a completely legitimate way, you're not laundering any money, even if there had been some nefarious way that I was completely unaware of that that money had initially come from one company to um, to generation now. Now, backing up for a second, another totally incorrect thing that was said by um, United States Attorney De Villers at his press conference that is kind of continued throughout that complaint is that First Energy was the only contributor to generation now. That's provably false, that is not true, that has been debunked by other media reports and things, by the way, that I happened to know at the time about other companies who were, who were giving to this effort. So the idea that I somehow knew that there was something nefarious happening between First Energy and Generation Now, and then that money was coming to me and I was putting it back out in the world, that's the definition of money laundering. None of that ever happened. I didn't have any knowledge of anything. I'm not even convinced to this day that there was anything nefarious happening between First Energy and, um, and Speaker Householder or Generation Now. But even if there was, no one ever involved me in a conversation like that. I didn't overhear any of that. I wasn't part of Team Householder. I would never have been involved in any conversations that would have given me any reason to believe that such a quid pro quo was underway. And the government must establish that I knew that in order to make anything that I did from that point forward money laundering. And they never will be able to do that. But when you hear that First Energy gave $61 million through this effort, that this money was, whether you want to use the term funneled or not, that this money came to Generation Now to get a specific outcome, doesn't that sound like it's wrongdoing? Doesn't that sound like bribery and conspiracy to push forward their agenda and to get other politicians and lobbyists to back it? Well. Like you said, you, it's, it's something that people are trying to make sound bad and sound maybe worse than it is. What I have to focus on is, and the government still needs to, uh, to establish each individual's role in what they claim is a conspiracy. And so you, they can't just say, oh, there was a conspiracy that happened over here, let's throw him in it too, and then he'll get convicted with everyone else. They still, thank goodness, would still have to establish how I was involved in any conspiracy. So let's just accept for a moment, and I'm not suggesting that this is the case, but if there in fact were some kind of conspiracy that were happening, what I can tell you unequivocally, I wasn't involved in it. And so there's no reason to have me in this, uh, in, involved in this case, and that will ultimately be the result for me. Two of these men have pled guilty. Do you anticipate that they are being pressured to testify against you? Well, not if they're going to tell the truth. Do you think they're going to be pressured, or do you think they will testify against Larry Householder? No one would be able to make an agreement um, with the government in terms of 
a cooperation agreement or sentencing recommendation or whatnot without absolutely telling the truth. And so, look, those two gentlemen who have had to make tough decisions based on their own circumstances that have nothing to do with me, um, they, do, they did what they needed to do for, for their own reasons, based on, I'm sure, conversations with their attorneys, uh, based on their own situations personally, family, whatnot. Um, and they have done, they've chosen to do what, what they needed to do, and I, I wish them, you know, Godspeed as they, you know, go forward in this process. Um, that doesn't speak to anything that, uh, that I did, and I, I'm never, you're never going to see me. I can't, look, I can't go and cut a deal and, and, and confess in open court to something I didn't do. That would be illegal. That's perjury. And I'm not going to do that. And the government knows that I'm not going to do that. And so, look, you know, I mean, you asked at the very beginning, why choose to do this? This is what fighting back looks like. You sit around for 10 months and you take these punches and you read these things that have been put out that are either completely untrue. Look, there's, there's, there's a passage in that complaint and in the indictment where Agent Wetzel states unequivocally that at no point in time did I ever have a discussion again with Tyler about the political projects that that I had hired him to do. That's not true. And he knows that that's not true. And again, I'm not able to talk about the discovery and the evidence that's out there because they can, but I can't because of this protective order. But trust me, when that, when that evidence comes out, he's going to have to explain why he made that statement in this under complaint, in, in this indictment, under oath, that is totally and provably 100% false. You have now, there were five of you charged, two pled guilty, one apparently committed suicide. You and Larry Householder still standing. What's it like to be in that position? Well, um, again, the way that this works is though, even though you're, you know, you're, you're charged as one conspiracy, there's one trial, um, you know, all five are kind of lumped together and potentially others will be added to it, who knows. The government still has to establish each individual's role they'll never be able to establish my role in any of those things. They can't prove I laundered money. They can't prove I was uh, you know, part of some grander conspiracy that I had any knowledge. Um, uh, and, and ultimately, they'll never be able to prove what their, th this payment that, that was made, that it, that it was somehow involved in some kind of bribe. Because it just wasn't, it never was. And one by one, the government's going to have to go through and explain all the things that they've done and they've said that have been completely wrong. They don't really worry all that much, I think, about playing fast and loose with the truth because what almost always happens in these situations is, well, for one, the person that they charge is often guilty. In this case, that's not the case, but usually that's their experience when they charge someone. And then they get that person to plea to something. But once you've pleaded to something, you really can't go back and complain about anything that's happened to you that was unfair or untoward because you've sort of given up any, any, uh, any right to be able to do that. Well, I'm not going to plea to anything I didn't do. That's just not happening. And um, I'm going to continue to fight this because the things that they have set out to try to, um, to, to prove that they, that they have alleged and that they think that they can prove or had thought at one point in time that they can prove against me, they'll never be able to prove. And, and the, the, the reality is that they know that. And so now it's just a matter of whether or not they'll do the right thing and move on from my involvement in this situation. And that's what I'm hopeful they'll do. Can you foresee a time when you can ever rebuild your reputation, rebuild your business? Um, you know, there's been a lot of relationships that I think have been tested by uh, this situation. Um, unfortunately, there were people who uh, saw this very difficult situation for me and decided to try to capitalize it on it for themselves. Um, the Attorney General, for example, the Secretary of State and some of his staff, for example. I don't know that there will ever be a rapprochement between me and those people for their complete and total failure of character uh, in, in you know, how, how they've dealt with these things. Um, and uh, But it would have to start, if there were any, I'm not sure there will be any. I mean. Um, I, you know, uh, I don't know if my, my wife would ever allow me to, uh, to, to reestablish contacts with those people once I'm exonerated. Uh, it would have to start with a public apology from them, um, which I know they will do eventually. Uh, it's just a matter of when. 
and um, but but then from that point forward, I'm really not sure. So I'm not really focused on what the world looked like on July 19th of 2020. It probably will never be the same again, and for good reason. Um, a situation like this, as unfortunate as it is and has been for me, it's probably allowed me to get some some difficult people out of my life that should probably have never been in there in the first place. Um, and we'll move on and, and we'll be fine. And um, with regard to what my reputation and whatnot, my reputation down the line will be somebody who was accused of something that he didn't do and then was ultimately exonerated. And then, um, you know, I'll have an opportunity to, uh, to get involved in, in, in different things and other things, whether they're in the political sphere or not. And, um, and, and move forward from there. And the only people whose opinion I really care about um, with regard to how they see me moving forward uh, you know, is my family, my, my immediate group of friends, um, people who have expressed you know, unfailing support uh, even from the very beginning. And um, you know, to look at some of these relationships that have been almost certainly ir irreparably damaged, I'm, it, I'm not really worried about whether or not I could ever restore those, and I have no interest in restoring any kind of relationship with uh, Trump world or, or, uh, or even uh, these people in, in the current Justice Department who are you know, behaving in a way that um, history won't treat them kindly. Before I let you go, what do you want people to know about you? Um, I, I think the folks that uh, know me know that I would never be involved in anything like what's been alleged. I wasn't, um, and I wouldn't be, uh, and, I, and I, I haven't been, um, and they already know that. I think one of the challenges, though, is you know, every lawyer tells you when, when something like this happens, unfortunately, if something like this were to happen to you, they all tell you, just don't say anything. You know, say nothing. And so for many months, that's really been uh, the advice that I have been taking. Now, of course, I spoke with uh, my attorneys about beginning to speak up about some of these things since we've been putting some more things in the public domain here recently. Um, and, but I really felt like there are a lot of other folks in the community who just really needed to hear from me. Um, when you're accused of something that's bad and you don't say anything in your own defense, it kind of lends the suggestion that you know, maybe you're admitting that you may have been involved in something. People need to be able to defend themselves and um, and, and that's what I'm doing, and so, and I'll continue to do that. Um, however, this proceeds and wherever it leads, um, and so, you know, that's that's really what sitting down with you today, and I appreciate the opportunity to do that, has has been all about. You know, though, people will look at you. You know what a C4 is used for. What that you don't have to say who's putting money into it. That it's supposed to be for a social purpose, and even though you said also it can be used for for a ballot initiative. But people are going to look at this and say, wait a minute, $61 million funneled from a utility through this, comp through this fund. How did you, someone as smart as you, who's been around the block as long as you have been, how did you not know that this was bribery, money, and money laundering? Well, first of all, I'm still not sure that it was bribery money. That has never been established. In order for this to be, bribery, again, a term of art, a, a legally defined term, and in, in that the United States Supreme Court has, had, uh, has ruled as to what elements need to be established in order for that term bribery to, um, to, to, to have any, um, any bearing, uh, there had to be a specific quid pro quo. Was there one? I don't know. I've never seen any evidence that there had been one. Larry Householder doesn't seem to be willing to admit that he agreed to a specific quid pro quo. First Energy hasn't been willing to uh, admit at this point in time. So if there, if there had been one, I didn't know about it. I'm not, again, I'm not suggesting that there was one. If, if there were, if it turns out that there were, well, I didn't know anything about it. And therefore, anything that flowed from there, from my involvement in my very legitimate aspect of what I was doing for, for the project that I was hired to do, had no bearing on whether or not there was, there was something nefarious going on upstream. I was a vendor like dozens of others who haven't and almost certainly won't be charged with anything. Um, but there was an opportunity, I think, politically to throw me into something. The, these folks knew I was working 
Uh, they were very aware I was working uh, on a PAC for, um, for Joe Biden as a Republican for Biden, a high-profile high uh, Republican for Biden, and they wanted to shut that down. And um, they were able to do that. Uh, ultimately, it didn't save them the election, but um, an opportunity to, di to discredit someone like me, I think, um, maybe proved a little bit too tempting to some. And um, meanwhile, the house of cards they built in terms of what they're claiming my involvement with all this stuff was has, is crumbling you know, more and more all the time. You were working for Conway, right, for that group? Uh, no, actually, no, I didn't. Um, I, I did not. I had an opportunity to get involved with the Lincoln Project, but um, but declined. I, I was helpful to them in terms of connecting what, them. What what Biden pack were you working for? Uh, it was one that actually Anthony Scaramucci and I had oh, started okay. together. Um, who really is a, a, a an He's interesting a guy? Yeah, quite a character. <laughs> okay. um, we were called the Right Side Pack, and we were doing that. And I mean, there's even been some recent um, coverage uh, on the Red State blog just the other day um, that is proof that the people involved in Trump world were very worried about the things that we were doing, the way that we were specifically targeting our efforts to the voters that we were targeting. That's exactly how they lost. And they definitely had motivation to shut down our effort. Was that what was behind, you know, bringing this kind of uh, chaos into my life? Maybe, we'll find out. And, you know, if, if we do, if, if I'm the government, I do not want to bank my entire case on the hope that there wasn't, at some point in time, some communication, some email, some direction from somewhere up, upstream to make sure to get me involved in it and to, to, uh, and, and to you know, manipulate my involvement and potentially the timing of all those things because I, I would be very uneasy if I were an assistant prosecutor because that would obviously destroy their entire case. Um, demonstrating that there was a, a political motivation coming from upstream. And knowing the, the way that the Trump Justice Department and others in that sphere operated, their coordinated messaging response after, we, after I was arrested, immediately coming out with a statement from the state party and from Trump team saying, uh, Matt Borges should suspend all of his political activities immediately. Um, I'd be very worried if I were on the government side, and uh, I think they are. We have come to the end of this interview, and you have agreed that we're, we can put this entire interview Please. online. I would appreciate it. The that. entire thing will be available. Is there anything you want to add to this? Um, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, um, to have this forum, uh, to be able to speak out, and um, I'm going to continue to. Um, if people hear this kind of thing and hear this kind of behavior from the government. Look, right now we're dealing with a situation where um, the government is withholding what's called Brady material, um, it, 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 evidence we know that they're in possession of um, that is exculpatory to me. They won't give it to us. They have to, by rule, they, they, they have to give it to us, but they're withholding it um, for reasons unknown. Um, they, they've changed their theory of my involvement of the case uh, two or three different times now. Um, and, um, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, th this is going to lead to a place where, where all of that stuff is going to be vetted and all that stuff is going to be put out into the, to, to the public domain. And they're going to have to defend why they've handled things the way, they, the way they had. What they wanted from the beginning was for me to cop a plea and then it would all sort of go away. Well, that's not going to happen. And um, it's going to be a long struggle and fight, and I understand that, and it's going to be unpleasant. But we're going to get there, and when we do, um, you know, I'll hold my head high, and I'll show my daughter that when you're accused of something you didn't do, even if it's by, even if it's by people who are very powerful and have the ability to do a lot of you know, really untoward and unpleasant things, you fight. You fight for your honor. You fight for your integrity and your name and uh, you don't stop fighting until you know you get where where you need to go and, and that's that's what I'm going to do. Thanks for talking to us. All right, thank you.